Okay, it's going to be a review of WrestleMania 26. This is going to re be a remix of the pay-per-view to make up for the uh, extremely crappy uh, webcam uh, audio quality. Uh, but hey, man, we're going to go all the way back to March 28th, uh, 2010. This is from Glendale, Arizona, the University of Phoenix Stadium. Uh, they do an attendance of 72,219. Uh, we're actually down again. Uh, in terms of the buy rate, we have eight eight hundred and eighty five thousand. So it, it, it's pretty much down, um, you know, from WrestleMania twenty five, almost about you know seventy thousand less. I, I I don't think you know WrestleMania rematches uh, normally do that well. I I just think you didn't really have a lot of fresh matchups uh, on this show. You're experimenting with new stars like Sheamus and Jack Swagger that you know still weren't really resonating with everybody. So yeah, the buy rate kind of makes sense to me. Um, I, I believe, you know, bringing in The Rock for 27, 28, you know, th those actually did much better buy rates than uh, WrestleMania 26. But uh, as a whole, I, I think it's a pretty good WrestleMania. I, I just remember at the time, everybody was happy with it. Um, it was def definitely a step up from WrestleMania 25, uh, you know, overall, like, you know, just in terms of the whole show. And, uh, you know, still better than, you know, maybe WrestleMania 27, 28, and 29. I, I don't think it really was until maybe 30 or 31 where they, you know, you know, possibly top this show. Uh, but still, I, I still think it's probably, you know, the best WrestleMania of the late, you know, 20s. Not 1920s, but you, you know what I'm saying. Uh, WrestleMania 20s. Um, and yeah, probably like the the best pay per view of 2010. You know, th this isn't you know very much like 2006. You know, this this was a WrestleMania where you know even though 2010 is a pretty crappy year, you got a lot of guys just leaving the company left and right. You know, the newer guys aren't really you know resonating with a lot of people. But you know, the the, the bottom line is it's it's still a really really good WrestleMania, and um, you're you're pulling out a lot of stops, and you're giving us the Bret Hart and Vince McMahon uh, you know dream match. Which ended up being more of a nightmare than a dream, but it was still there were still some good things about it. You know, if you want to argue that it was great closure for Bret Hart fans, you know, I, I could definitely see that. So it's a great night for Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels uh, if you're big fans of those guys growing up. So so overall, I, I think it's a very very fun WrestleMania. Yeah, I mean th there were some stuff on this show uh, that you could argue was disappointing. You know, disappointing is the most, you know obvious word that comes to mind when when a lot of people describe edge and jericho i think edge and jericho had a ton of potential i just think you know in some ways the timing of it was just kind of bad uh but we'll we'll explain it when we get to the match i you know def definitely have a lot to say about it first match of the night we got the miz and the big show defending the tag team championships against uh john morrison and our truth man this only got three minutes and 20 seconds man it didn't feel that short i i thought it was fun while it lasted man but Miz and Big Show, they're actually going by the tag team name of uh, Show Miz. Uh, pretty clever. You know, the, the, the word Show Biz. You got Big Show and the Miz. Uh, show, the Show Business. Clever, right? Or not. I don't know. <laughs> Depending on how you feel about it. But um, it, it was really cool to see Morrison involved in this match. At the time, Morrison... Uh, had his own DVD out. You get to see him surfing and you know, uh, you know, running, running all all over the walls in the arenas. It was it was quite the the sight to see. Uh, you know, him and him and Miz have a lot of history. So, um, you know, you like that about the match. You know, it didn't overstay its welcome. I thought it was fun. Uh, you know, the ending was really really cool with the blind tag and Big Show actually punches. Uh, I think it was Morrison on on the springboard uh, in Seguri. Uh, to get the pinfall there. So Miz and Big Show retain. Uh, it's the Miz's first WrestleMania. Uh, you know, this, I mean, first WrestleMania to actually get on the main show. And, um, you know, the very next year he will be in the main event. So, uh, you know, uh, props to the Miz for all his perseverance through the years. It's pretty cool that he opens up WrestleMania one year and he closes it the next year. Uh, we're going to move on to Randy Orton uh, taking on Cody Rhodes. And Ted DiBiase Jr., uh, this is a triple threat match featuring everybody from Legacy right here. Um, really, really interesting match. I've got a lot to say about it. So Randy Orton, you know, goes from WrestleMania, uh, the WrestleMania main event the previous year. Uh, this year, he's very, very low uh, on the undercard here. And uh, yeah, it felt a little bit more natural. Um, 
You know, it's also Cody Rhodes of first WrestleMania. I thought Cody Rhodes was jacked up here, man. You could tell he really trained heavy on the weights. This is probably like the most jacked up I've seen him in the WWE. But but still, something was a little bit off uh, about his look. And then Ted DiBiase Jr., you know, his dad just got inducted into the Hall of Fame uh, the night before. So a huge weekend for the DiBiase family. Um, this is an interesting triple threat match and, um, you know, one of the very few triple threats that you'll see and maybe the only one in WWE history, at least in WrestleMania history, a triple threat match with no championship on the line. Very rarely, you know, do you see these types of matches. This kind of felt like more of a handicap match. And, uh, you know, this, this is a triple threat. You know, usually when you see a triple threat on the indies or in TNA, you know, you're going to expect a lot of high flying, a lot of sunset flips, you know, three guys suplexing each other. This was the opposite. They were very, you know, anti, you know, spot here. It, it just seemed like at this time with the WWE, they, they, they were very like anti, you know, Japanese strong style and very, very anti uh, indie. It, it definitely felt like that. It, it felt like they were very high on having a great body and just, you know, wrestling a very methodical WWE style with a lot of, you know, simplistic storytelling. So that that's what this match kind of offered here. You know, there is dissension between the uh, the Rhodes family, not not the Rhodes family, but, you know, the, the legacy uh, stable. Um, you know, they were bickering back and forth on commentary about, you know, whether they should put their egos aside and, and stay together or, you know, for their individual futures, is this the right thing to do to really, you know, break up the group? So, um, it was, it was a really, really interesting match. I, I actually enjoyed, you know, uh, at the rumble, like the, uh, you know, Orton actually turning on Cody and, and DiBiase. They, the fans are nat naturally, you know, gravitating towards Orton. I thought Orton was okay here. You know, I, I, th I think he, he looked a little bit more, you know, explosive than he did in 2009. There's just something off about Orton in 2009, like in the ring. I, I think he was still trying to readjust to his new physique. And he was, I think he was really trying his hardest, you know, to stay injury free. So I think Orton looked pretty good here. You know, this featured just a lot of, you know, double teaming, uh, you know, just a lot of baiting from Orton. I mean, it was, it was pretty good. I wouldn't say it was great. Um, you know, Randy actually punts Cody and then DiBiase locks on the Million Dollar Dream. And, uh, you know, Orton had a really good counter to it. He fought it off well. And it almost looks like he... The ending is sweet, though. It looks like Randy tries to fake DiBiase out with a drop kick, And then he hits the RKO. So you get a sweet finish there. DiBiase does the job. So it's still, it's still kind of left the door open for Randy to do some stuff with Cody. But, hey, it's Cody's first WrestleMania main event. Um, you know... I, th I thought this was fun, but it it just it just wasn't that memorable. Like in terms of you know this being you know a standout match from any of these three guys. But we're gonna move on, man, to the Money in the Bank ladder match. We got Jack Swagger taking on Christian, Dolph Ziggler, Drew McIntyre is the Intercontinental Champion. Apparently, Drew was supposed to face Taker at WrestleMania, going way back. You know, like you know the, the but obviously those plans were scrapped. Um, you got Evan Bourne out there better known as Matt Seidel. You got Kane, the dark horse once again. You got Kofi Kingston, Matt Hardy, MVP, uh, and Shelton Benjamin. You know, th this was kind of like the tamest performance I think Shelton had at Money in the Bank so far. There really wasn't, you know, he didn't kill himself in this match. Um, yeah, so it, it definitely felt like Shelton was kind of, you know, this might have been his last year with the company for a while. Uh, but, you know, th this Money in the Bank right here, it, f it felt like a lot of guys, it, it felt like it didn't overstay its welcome. And it, it didn't feel like it burned out the crowd. And, um, you know, for whatever reason, you know, the, the, the crowd really wasn't that into it at first. But as the match progressed, it definitely got a little bit interesting. Yeah, I think it's a good Money in the Bank ladder match. This is the last one that they did at WrestleMania. So then the Money in the Bank's kind of in 2010. I think it was in it was in June, right, or July. The Money in the Bank got its own pay-per-view. So it's the last one at WrestleMania. And it, it's... You could definitely argue this is is the weakest one, maybe the second to weakest one. It, it, it was definitely still good, though, man. I, I really, really enjoyed this. Um, the negative is this is like your ideal, you know, money in the bank where, you know, the guy winning, you know, just shouldn't, you know, be champion. It's almost like, you know, we're just going to have the money in the bank because it's WrestleMania. But, you know, there's really nobody in this match that you want to, 
you know, cash in and be champion. At, at the time, I think Christian probably would have been the best choice. If I could go back in time, I, I, I would say this. I'm, I was trying to think of, you know, I was cool with Jericho and Edge. I really was, especially, you know, at the time. And I, I'm a big fan of Jericho and Edge. But I, I would definitely agree there is something off about the timing. But maybe the best way to, you know, Maybe the best solution to 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 improve the matchup would would have just been to put Christian in the world title match. You get Jericho, Chris, you know Jericho Edge and Christian, the three Canadians, three great Canadian wrestlers in one triple threat match. You know Christian at the time it felt like he was kind of still stuck in ECW at this time. I don't even know if ECW was still in business at this time. You know they might have been transitioning to NXT, but you know. I just think the the decision to have Swagger win and then cash on cash in on Jericho on the very next SmackDown, I, I think that was a big uh, mistake, and it, it definitely felt like at this time as well, like the championships just didn't feel credible. Like we're just putting the championships on guys just so we could you know make WrestleMania a little bit more sexier. So yeah, I wasn't a big fan of the Swagger cash, and I I like Swagger though. I just think the timing felt forced. I, I, I think more than anything, this 2009, 2010 year, we're, we're, we're putting the championships on guys uh, before they've earned it, whether it be Sheamus, whether it be Swagger, you know, and we're so used to seeing guys like uh, a Chris Benoit or Eddie Guerrero, uh, you know, put their lives on the line just to, you know, be in that spot. So it's it's just tough. It was just tough to get excited, you know, to, to see guys like Swagger and Sheamus uh, win the belts, you know, at this particular time. But hey, man, uh, back to the money in the back ladder match. I thought the match was good. I thought it was fun. Um, you know, Ziggler, you know, a great debut from him. Um, you know, McIntyre got a lot of heat here. Every, anytime McIntyre was going for the belt, uh, lots of booze. I remember the the only, you know, there's not a lot of podcasts of this show. The, the only review I remember watching uh, for this was uh, Big Rats, and he was very anti McIntyre, and he had a good call here. There was there was some back and forth between Matt Hardy and Christian, where Matt's going for the twist of fate off the ladder, Christian counters it into an inverted DDT off the ladder, and then Michael Cole shouts out, "What a twist of fate! A twist of fate from Christian!" And then and then Big Rat goes like. Michael Cole called that a twist twist of fate. Are you kidding me? Good good job, Michael Cole. So I just thought that was really funny. Um very animated there. But um yeah, man, I, I mean I I think I think this match had uh you know, it didn't overstay its welcome. There there was just some really, really innovative stuff. I mean the highlight would definitely be Kofi Kingston. I think Kane actually split the ladder in half. You know, Kofi got the two pieces of the ladder and he used them as stilts. Uh, to try to, you know, grab the Money in the Bank briefcase and the way he was kind of using both ladders to to, to climb up there. Great balance, you know, just great innovation there from Kofi. It just seemed like Kofi just always did something innovative with the Rumble or Money in the Bank. And, uh, you know, the, the Stills thing is really, really cool. I mean, that's something that you'll see, like, if you go to, like, a foreign country. I mean, the last time I saw it was when I went to Jamaica, when I got off the cruise. Um, that's like the first thing I remember seeing, just someone dressed up like, like 20 feet tall and they had uh, stilts on and a costume. So the stilts thing was really, really cool. Um, well, yeah, man, I, I think more than anybody, Evan Bourne really, you know, did some really cool things. The Meteora onto the ladder, uh, from Evan Bourne was cool. He actually did a shooting star press off the ladder, which was, you know, pretty sweet. You know, Bourne really just had some, you know, standout moments here. A lot of, a lot of other guys didn't really stand out, you know, the way Evan Bourne did. And, uh, you know, Swagger, I guess the most memorable thing he did in this match is he was kind of stuck between, you know, in the middle of three ladders. And then they started like sandwiching him, which is, you know, the, the tip of the ladder, just, just him, him taking the brunt of the tip of the ladders being sandwiched. Like that was pretty cool. But, uh, you know, the ending, you know, it looked like Christian was going to win. It looks like Christian was going to get his big moment for the second year in a row. And then, uh, you know, Swagger kind of comes out of nowhere and, uh, you know, gets booed like crazy. You know, the fans just really weren't buying uh, Swagger winning this match, but hey, it, it's a fun Money in the Bank ladder match. With this particular match, it's it's just a, definitely a good mix. It's a good mix of you know guys like Christian and Matt who always lived in the shadow of Jeff and Edge. Uh, you know, Kane always lives in the shadow of Taker, and then you got a lot of a lot of just young up and coming guys that are still trying to find it. So, Money in the Bank ladder match gets a thumbs up for me. But uh, you could definitely argue the weakest out of the uh, WrestleMania ones. Okay, next up we have Triple H taking on Sheamus. Um, 
Good match right here, man, between Triple H and Sheamus. Very underrated. If this was the main event, though, it, it would have gotten the Triple H and Orton treatment from WrestleMania 25. So, you know, th there were rumors that this was going to be for the championship and, and possibly main event. Uh, uh, you know, thank God that didn't happen. I just don't think, I think Triple H is somewhat past his prime at this time. I, I think Sheamus just wasn't ready for that moment. Uh, but hey, man, you, you know, it, it is true. They kind of brought it out into the real life storyline here that Sheamus grew up, you know, idolizing Triple H and, you know, wanted to be like him. And, you know, I, I think that's one of the reasons why Sheamus got, got pushed so soon. Um, you know, there were rumors that, that Triple H was definitely behind Sheamus winning the championship. And, you know, I think one of the reasons would be uh, Seamus was very forthcoming that, you know, he was, you know, the, the guy I looked up to was Triple H. I think he even said that, uh, you know, Triple H and Undertaker from WrestleMania 17 was his, you know, favorite match uh, growing up. Um, so, yeah, that goes a long way with Triple H. You know, you remember the Goldberg thing, you know, where he tore the, you know, they, they tore the Goldberg posters up on Tough Enough and... He was quoted as saying, you could tell a lot from, you know, guys by who they looked up to. So, you know, the same thing with Kevin Owens as well. I, th I think Triple H, you know, looked at Owens and Owens was able to prove to him that, you know, he was he was a fan just by his knowledge of, uh, you know, Triple H's body of work. So, uh, you know, Triple H actually brought up the ultimate warrior squash here. He said, you know, you remind me of me and, you know, I used to be just like you. And you know what happened when I thought I could take on the biggest dog in the yard? I got destroyed. But you know what? It made me that much better. It, it drove me to become the game. So I like the fact that they brought up Warrior and, uh, you know, the, the loss to the Ultimate Warrior really, you know, awoke in Triple H and, you know, just lit a fire under his ass to, you know, you know become as good as he became. So I, th I thought that was a cool story here. So yeah, Triple H and Sheamus, you know, pretty good stuff. I mean, there, there were moments here where the crowd was kind of flat. You know, anytime Sheamus was on the offensive end, it was a very methodical performance from Sheamus. Some of his rest, ho rest holds just, you know, weren't very engaging. Um, he was going to work on Triple H's back. You know, Triple H, um, you know, not really known for having a bad back, but I, I do remember him saying several times that, you know, just in general, like like wrestlers, you know, most wrestlers do have bad backs. So Sheamus was doing a lot of, you know, Roderick Strong like uh, backbreakers to uh, to Triple H here. But you know, overall, I, I think it was I think it was pretty damn good. Um, you know, I, I think Triple H did a good job of, of, of working the crowd. You know, the crowd was definitely into Triple H. And in, in some ways, it almost felt like Triple H probably deserved to be, you know, in, in a higher profile match than this. I, I think you could definitely argue that, you know, if you could have found a way to put, you know, Triple H in the championship match with Jericho and Edge, I, I would, really wouldn't have been that opposed to it. Um, but I think, you know, at this particular time, I, I, I think when you look at Triple H's physique, he definitely put on a lot of weight. You know, over the year, he definitely looked a little bit more body fat. Uh, it, it, it definitely like this is 2010. This is his last year. I think after backlash or after extreme rules, like he started really, you know, taking a lighter schedule. So, uh, but hey, a good performance from Triple H here. I thought there was some really, really good counters out of the pedigree. Sheamus actually backdrops the pedigree, hits the bro kick, he hit the bro kick on the outside. And uh, Triple H pay, plays possum, and then he hits the pedigree out of nowhere. And it was good, man. It, there were some really, really good transitions here. So I, I think, you know, at this time, Sheamus really, you know, hadn't really found it yet. There, there just definitely seemed like there was a lack of respect for Sheamus. But, you know, over time, that definitely changed. You know, I would definitely say, like, Sheamus's renegade moment. And I'll explain it in a second. But Sheamus' big moment was was having that great match with Gunther. And, you know, the perception of Sheamus just definitely changed over the years. And I, what I mean by renegade moment, it was when, you know, Eminem, you know, earned a lot of, like, respect when he outperformed Jay-Z on Renegade. It's almost like, you know, Nas was coming out and Chris Rock was coming out just saying, like, he's the best rapper alive at the moment. So, and th that was really you know, his coming out party. So the same thing with Seamus. You know, eventually Seamus earned everybody's respect, but it just took a long time. But, you know, Triple H and Seamus, this is a really, really good, you know, underrated, you know, WrestleMania gem right here. It doesn't get a lot of love, but at the time, not a lot of people were interested in seeing it, but it, it held up pretty well. Next up, we have Rey Mysterio uh, taking on CM Punk. Had Mysterio lost he would have to join uh, the Straight Edge Society. They could have done a better job of, um, you know, promoting that stipulation. I didn't even realize it until, you know, just looking at Wikipedia here. 
Um, but I, I love the video package. So if you if you watch this video package, Punk uh, came off like the devil. So Mysterio singing "Happy Birthday" to uh, you know his youngest uh, daughter. What's her name? Is it Angela? Is it Angie? Or uh, God damn, I'm, I, I might be forgetting the name here. But you know, it, it's pretty cool to see Mysterio's kids you know, grow up with everybody, you know, from Dominic to, uh, and Aaliyah, her name is Aaliyah, my, my bad, I think Angie is the wife, um, you know, so Punk, you know, just did some really, really devilish things, I mean, the highlight would be singing happy birthday uh, to Aaliyah while she's walking backstage, and, and when they get a shot of a Punk doing it, and he just, he just looked like the devil, man. Something about his hair, you know, something about his facial expression. So, yeah, Punk could be a really, really good heel. This is a different type of heel for Punk. This is probably the most hated type of heel he ever was. You know, him and Mysterio uh, had a really good match right here. So, Punk comes out with Luke Ga Gallows and Serena. Okay, I think Punk and Mysterio, it, it ain't pretty good for me. I, I, I think this is a really, really good, you know, WrestleMania match right here. Um, the, the, the problem with it is people are going to look at the length. You know, six minutes and thirty seconds. It feels a little bit rushed. It, it it just it just feels like you know, as soon as the match started, we're kind of really getting into finisher mode. Um, so I think it has that working against it. It's probably the weakest in that little. I don't I don't remember if it was a trilogy, but you know, they definitely wrestled on you know several pay per views after this. Extreme Rules, Over the Limit. You know, might have stopped it Over the Limit. There might have been another match uh, the very next year. But I thought Mysterio and Punk, the, the feud was good. The, the match was good here. Um, it, it's funny. Punk must have ordered uh, Halloween Havoc. I could definitely see him ordering that. He's a big Piper fan, right? Piper vs. Hogan. And then Mysterio and Eddie on the uh, Halloween Havoc show. So so Mysterio actually does that reverse springboard DDT. Yeah, once again, man, not as beautiful as the Halloween Havoc, but it's pretty cool that they did it. It almost felt like it was a Punk idea. Uh, to do that, but you know, at the same time, you had Gallows and Serena, you know, constantly interfering with the six one nine. So Mysterio was just trying to find ways to get you know Punk out of the go to sleep. Eventually, he did. He was able to knock out Luke Gallows with the uh, go to sleep into the Hurricanrana. Then he does the six one nine, and then he hits him with the you know the, pretty much a, a, a vertical. Not a vertical, but a splash without even leaping. And uh, Mysterio puts Punk away in a, a pretty good match right here, man. This is this is, this was short. It was sweet. You know, wish it could have gotten more time. Uh, but I think it was a good performance by Punk. And it's it's really, you know, it's Punk's WrestleMania one-on-one -on -one debut. He's finally out of the money in the bank, you know, ladder situation, which, you know, took a long time. But, you know, we finally got there. Okay, next up, we got Bret Hart taking on Vince McMahon. This is a no-holds-barred lumberjack match with Bruce Hart as a special guest referee. All right, I'm not a huge fan of the actual match. I really don't even want to talk about the actual match. Uh, you know, the highlight would be, you know, Bret gets his revenge. Uh, Vince actually taps to the sharpshooter. I don't think Vince gets in one offensive move right here. Um, so, yeah, it's it's definitely the worst thing on the show. Would I say it's the worst WrestleMania match of all time? I would say no, but, uh, you know, that, I mean, you know, Brett wanted to wrestle Vince because, you know, he knew he had limitations. I think Brett even knew, you know, there were severe limitations. But I, I just want to talk about the, uh, you know, the overall, you know, <laughs> I'm going to go back to Montreal again. I just want to talk about the video package. I'm not going to really dig too deep into Montreal if I'll, I'll try not to. Uh, I thought the video package was great, though. I actually started tearing up during the video package. I, whatever song that they used here. I thought it worked. Um, I think the, the 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 feud during the current day was a little bit too over the top with you know Brett faking the knee injury. I didn't really care for that stuff, but I I just I love the song. I love them you know going back to the um, you know showing clips of the screw job. You know showing the Brett Brett screw Brett stuff. Um, you know, even, even, even the scene where Vince and Brett finally meet in in the ring after all these years. There's, you know, when you look deep into it. Like Vince, Vince was giving Brett a look like he's finally glad that the day finally came. You know, you could just see it in Brett's, in Vince's eyes that he knows that if it was not for this man, Bret Hart, you know, this company would have gone under. You know, maybe besides Sean, maybe besides Taker, you know, no one gave their heart and soul to this company more than Brett. You know, this company would not be around today if it wasn't for Brett, you know, um, I can't tell you how many times we, you know, turn on the TV Saturday morning or Monday night or whatever. And, you know, the guy that's, you know, carrying the load, 
while the big superstars aren't there. It's it was always Bret Hart. You know, even going back to you know the days where you're in kindergarten, first grade, you know, wh whatever. You know, it, it, Bret Hart was always there through thick and thin. You know, busting his ass uh, for Vince McMahon. So, um, but yeah, you know what really hit me here was. You know the 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 um you know relationship between Brett and Vince. You know Brett Brett has stated on, on many a times that he looked up to Vince as a father figure. See, with, with Kurt Kurt, it would make a little bit more sense for him to say that because Kurt's father died, you know, when he was sixteen years old. But you know, from what I understand, I think Stu, you know, Stu, um, you know, lived a pretty good life. You know, Stu was Stu died in two thousand three, um, you know. So he he was he was alive while Brett was in his prime, but I I, I guess, you know, there was just a, a a certain amount of trust that I think Brett thought he had uh, in Vince. You know, I I don't I don't know what happened here, man. I just I just think Vince was just very, you know, manipulated, you know, by a lot of guys. You know, he was you know he, the idea was presented to him, and um, I just think more than anything. Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes you you really have to be, you know, greedy. You have to be selfish. You have to be heelish. You have to be prickish uh, to get what you want. And I, I think at that particular time, uh, it's it's funny how the the screw job really led, uh, you know, to the success of the company. It it, it really really is. But um, but just just from Brett's perspective, though, I mean to. For, for that to happen to him, you know, to, to be betrayed by, you know, the father figure like that. I, I, I always say it time and time again, like, I, I definitely could sympathize with Brett. Like, I just know, I know what it feels like, you know, to have, you know, a, a, a parent turn on you, a family member turn on you, a, a, a you know, a female, a, a girl, uh, you know, totally turn on you. And uh, you know, so, so j just to think that Brett, you know, put all those you know, years of hard work and, and for it to just, you know, be devalued like that and just to be screwed like that. It, it's almost the equivalent of saying, you know, you know, you, you you made the company what it is, but now you're just a worthless piece of shit. It's just, that's the way that Brett took it. And, you know, the, the, and it's funny too, like, I, I just want to talk about the, um, the text message, you know, it, Brett was the one, Brett was probably the one that spoke up the loudest about the Vince McMahon allegations, the lawsuit and the text message. Brett really had the mentality of, he was just like, wow, that sounds like Vince. So no one really knows, you know, Vince better, you know, than Bret Hart. Um, so yeah, but you know, to, to, to be fair to Vince though, I, I do think that there's a side to Vince that is just very appreciative of Brett's hard work. I think there's a, a, a side of Vince that definitely wishes that it didn't have to happen. It's just, when you look back on it, it, it had to happen though. It, it had to happen. There, there's just no way that Brett was going to coexist with where the company was going. Uh, you know, the, the fi financially, you know, financial peril is the word that Vince used. I don't know if that was quite the case, but you know, the, the financial breathing room really opened the door up to just do some really monumental things going into 1998 so you definitely understand it so vince just being a prick being an asshole you know sometimes sometimes that's what you have to do when you want to get your company to the next level as he said ruthless aggression uh is what he used you know to squeeze his competition by the throat and you know there there, there definitely is a, a lot to that you know sometimes the nice guy you know doesn't always win you know sometimes the biggest asshole in the room is the most successful in the room and you know and in, in some ways vince kind of represents that in you know the same way that trump does so but hey man i i just don't think the match uh you know turned out that well uh, i get the point of it i'm surprised that brett was able to do it i just think that whole thing you know with the hearts being involved i, I think brett wanted his family to get some experience you know you, you get to see tyson kidd and and you know you know Davy Boy Smith Jr. in there. You know it was great for them, but I just don't like the way it was done. That Vince tried to buy them out, and then Brett, you know, you know knew about it, and you know then they were on Brett's side. It was it, it was what it was. I mean, they, 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 this got a lot of criticism the day after. A lot of people just thought this brought the show down. And but hey, man, uh, Brett gets his revenge on on Vince. A long time in the making. Apparently, Vince was just really determined to bring Brett back, and uh, it finally happened, so. Okay, next up we have Chris Jericho going up against the Long Forgotten Edge, as uh, Jericho would call him at the um, Slammy Awards. Uh, so Jericho versus Edge for the world title. 
Um, so, yeah, I mean, the championships definitely felt like they were just, you know, put on guys just for this show. Jericho and Batista, you know, just for this show. They they both ended up um, in the title picture here. Um, so Jericho actually wins the world title in the main event of Elimination Chamber, thanks to Shawn Michaels, uh, who cost Undertaker the match to, you know, um, you know, bait Undertaker into accepting his uh, challenge. So you definitely understand that. Um, Jericho took some shots at Edge for, uh, you know, being very injury prone. And he said, I, I don't get injured. I just win championships. I, I like some of that stuff. I, I like some of the stuff that Jericho said about, uh, you know, injuries and being injury prone. I think, yeah, that, that's definitely one of the, um, you know, best things about Jericho's career is he he's really kind of avoided you know, the major neck surgeries or the, you know, the major, you know, uh, you know, disabling, you know, disabilitating, what, what do you call it? The um, major knee surgeries. I think he actually did tear his ACL, uh, but, you know, the AC, he, he was just missing the ACL and it didn't really cost him any time. So in, in some ways, Jericho is right. He's really kind of dodged a lot of bullets in terms of injury, injuries. In, in terms of edge, it's been the opposite. He's had neck surgeries and, uh, you know, he ended up tearing his Achilles uh, in the summer of 2010 when, when Jericho and Edge were uh, summer of 2009 when Jericho and Edge were, you know, really successful as a tag team. It looked like they would really get to carry the load uh, with Degeneration X, you know, uh, heading into the fall. So uh, I like a lot of the storylines here. Edge actually wins the Rumble, gets a hero's welcome. Uh, you know, there was a little bit of mixed feelings. A, a lot of people just thought it was a little bit played out how guys could come back. Uh, from an injury and win the rumble it's a little bit too predictable it's a little it was a little bit you know i think um you know force fed at that time and you know in, in some ways the, the red carpet has been laid out for edge you know almost more than anybody i mean think about it how many championship victories was edge just given uh you know the the royal rumble uh victory as well and it's almost like some of these like moments that edge has had it's almost like he was like not even expecting them as christian alluded to in aew uh you know pushed to the moon with the rocket you know uh attached to his back I, you know something something along those lines so in some ways i think edge has really been over pushed to the point where even he's been a little bit like overwhelmed by it i'll give you another example that greatest match ever like you could see the pressure in Edge's, you know, promo like right before that match, that you know, greatest wrestling match of all time, with Randy Orton at, at Backlash. If anybody uh, remembers that, which was really, really pretty good, uh, but it was just kind of funny that they attached that to, you know, Edge's match right there. But uh, but yeah, we have Jericho and Edge. Uh, the general consensus is that it was a little bit disappointing. I remember uh, JR Sports Brief, you know, he covered sports, you know, WrestleMania is so big, he actually touched on it as well. He mentioned that he thought the match was boring. So I, I think if you're not like a diehard wrestling fan, um, and if you don't know a lot about Jericho and Edge, you know, maybe that's the perception. Maybe you found this a little bit boring. I, I think it's disappointing in terms of uh, the reaction for Edge. I, I think by this time, I, I don't think a lot of fans were really dying to see Edge win a championship, it's it was already done to death at this point. You know, it was cool to see Edge back, but, you know, he just didn't look great. You know, he, he definitely looked like he wasn't in tip-top shape. He wasn't moving that well off of the Achilles. A lot of it had to do with selling. So he did some really good selling, but it, it almost felt like it was a combination of selling and just natural pain by the way he was hobbling around out there uh, coming off of the Achilles. I mean, the Achilles is bad, man. You know, tearing your Achilles... It's, it's probably, you know, one of the worst injuries you could get in terms of losing your explosiveness. Uh, so it should be really interesting to see how Aaron Rodgers uh, comes back from it. It, it. it does seem like the surgeries have gotten more advanced and better. But you just remember Kobe, you know, never quite the same after the Achilles. I think even The Rock uh, tore his Achilles, which kind of went under the radar because it was during you know, his hiatus in Hollywood. So there really isn't a match that you can point to and say, oh, you know, the Achilles really fucked up the rock uh, in the ring. But you could definitely tell, like, Edge just really wasn't, you know, the same here. I, I think that kind of played into it. I think the timing was kind of bad, too. See, I, I would have preferred to see Jericho get a championship match, um, you know, the, the previous WrestleMania. I felt like the heel character was a little bit hotter then. This was still good, but it was still kind of Jericho, 
a little bit on the way out. You know, he was going to leave the company, I think, in September. So in some ways, I think Jericho lost a little bit of that that heat that he had, you know, going back to, uh, you know, the summer of 2008. But, you know, the, the bottom line is here, I still like the match, though. You know, Jericho and Edge are, you know, great friends. I think they even reviewed, like, WrestleMania 31 together. So, you know, name two wrestlers that actually reviewed a WrestleMania together. They actually did it, I think, with WrestleMania 31. Um and uh, yeah, you could just tell they're they're good friends. That's why I would have loved to have seen G Christian in this match. And if you put Christian in this match, it's the three guys that drove home on uh, on the way back from the 9/11 uh, tapings in Houston. I think they had to drive home together because you know all the flights were canceled. Uh, but hey, in terms of the creativity here, I give it a thumbs up. In terms of the innovativeness. Uh, I thought it was good. The ring psychology was good with Jericho transitioning the walls of Jericho into Lance Storm Achilles lock, the half crab into the Achilles lock. I thought that was really, really creative. But I'll tell you, the the, the sequences of counters was genius and, and the, the execution was good. Um it's just the crowd just really wasn't that into the actual match. I think that's the problem. But, you know, the lion salt into the edge o -matic was spot on. The, uh, you know, the spear into the code breaker was pretty cool. Uh, Jericho actually actually did get the fans to fire up when he was kind of mocking Edge with the spear. So I, Edge had a really, really funny line in the um, video package here. He said, you know, you like to call yourself the best in the world at what you do. I said, no, Chris, you're the best in the world in getting speared by me. <laughs> so some of Edge's lines here were, were a little bit like funny. I, I think at the time the spear stuff was kind of forced. You almost get the feeling like the spear stuff you know, it was almost like a Vince call. Like, you know, I, I could see Vince saying, like, get the fans riled up and say, spear, spear, spear. So uh, over time, I think it, pl it it actually worked out well for Edge. I think, I think I think the fans actually got really into this stuff. But at this WrestleMania, it just didn't catch on yet. Um, you know, Jericho actually, you know, takes out the belt. Um, he actually takes Edge's neck, rams him against the rope, you know, hits the referee. So behind the referee's back, Jericho smashes Edge with the title. Uh, Edge actually kicks out of that. You know, the fans kind of, you know, reacted to that. And then Jericho wins with the code breaker, believe it or not. Actually uh, inspired by uh, the legendary uh, Naomichi Marafuji. Uh, who would have thought that Jericho would have, you know, used that move uh, to win a title match at WrestleMania? It's pretty cool when you look back on it. But hey, man, I, I like the match. And I, I think it's better than people give it credit for. I know a lot of people think Cena and Batista was better, and, and I do think Cena and Batista was better. I'm actually going to say I'll change my mind. I'll say Cena and Batista had a hotter crowd. I think they had a better match in a shorter amount of time. So it's kind of funny. The two sports entertainer, you know, bodybuilders in Cena and Batista have the better match than the two Canadian wrestlers in Jericho and Edge. I'll definitely say that, but I still think Jericho and Edge was good. I think it's a solid match. I, I don't think it's anywhere near as disappointing as Edge and AJ Styles or even AJ Styles and Nakamura. I, I still think it's a good match. I just wish I, I like the idea of either putting Triple H in this match as a triple threat, or you could even put, um, you know, Christian in this match as a triple threat. I, I, I think I would have preferred that looking back on it, but I, I still think it was cool that Jericho and Edge finally you know, found their way to WrestleMania to have a singles match. But it's not the best Jericho and Edge match. I, I think the steel cage match that they had on SmackDown, both guys are in their prime. They're moving, you know, more explosively back then. It was, that was a really, really good cage match. Even Fla Flair, I think, told uh, either Edge or Jericho that it was one of the best cage matches he had ever seen. So, you know, that says a lot there. But, uh, but yeah, I just think the timing was just bad. You know, Edge coming off of the injury, Jericho kind of, you know, not in the kind of shape that he was in, you know, earlier on in his uh, return. It was just a little bit of weak timing in terms of the actual match. But, um, you know, the creativity and the chemistry, I, I think, was pretty good, you know, when you look back on it. All right, next up we have a 10 Diva tag match. Um this ends with Vicky Guerrero kind of botching the frog splash. Uh, but yeah, it's not a great match. Beth Phoenix looked good. You know, most of the girls, Kelly Kelly looked really hot, but you know, the, the, the match just wasn't great. I, I don't think it was the worst, you know, divas match that we've seen. I definitely think it's a, a, it was a lot better than the divas battle Royal from the previous year, but it ends with Vicky, um, you know, doing her thing. Okay. Next up, we got Batista defending the WWE championship from John Cena. Uh, 
Okay, so at Elimination Chamber, you almost forget about this. Elimination Chamber, maybe the first match on that show, um, Cena actually wins the belt back from Sheamus. Yeah, uh, Triple H actually pinned Sheamus to kind of, you know, bring bring fire to their WrestleMania match. Uh, but but Cena ends up winning that Elimination Chamber. Does, does he actually make Triple H tap out there? I think he might have. I think I think Cena and Triple H end that match, but Cena wins the belt back, the WWE belt, the the spinny belt, and uh, I think it was Vince. Vince comes out and just kind of orders Batista to challenge Cena for the title, and it's almost like a money in the bank cash in for Batista as he spears and Batista bombs Cena to win the WWE title. So it, it, in some ways, they just wanted um, Batista to have the championship so you could promote. Uh, Batista and Cena. Um, ultimately, uh, Cena wins it back. So, so the mentality is: Why would you have Batista win the championship just to drop it to Cena at WrestleMania? I think, I think the reason was um, Batista was uh, leaving the company. It, it wouldn't make sense for Batista, um, you know, to win the belt at WrestleMania, and it wouldn't even make sense for him to retain if he was leaving. So, in some ways, Batista was inspired by Triple H's. Um, you know, feud with him with Batista and uh, decides to put Cena over three times in a row uh, on the way out, which almost became, you know, one of those things that, you know, guys would never want to do, but it almost became the cool thing on the block to do. I think you even saw uh, Seth Rollins do that with Cody, you know, uh, last year, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. So, um, but hey, man, you know, there was definitely a cool factor to Batista here. I thought he was, I thought he was good. I, I think he looked good at this time. It looked like he slimmed down a little bit. You know, he shaved his head. He definitely had a little bit of a cool factor there, but he's calling out Cena you know, very very similar to Punk, you know, leading up to Money in the Bank, calling out uh, the the WWE and Cena for, you know, somehow the torch, the um, the torch got passed to you from Stone Cold Steve Austin. You know, you're on the cover of magazines, movies, championship victories, commercials. He's he, Batista saying, you know, I should have been the face of the company. I should have been the one. And and then and then Cena kind of responded by saying, you know, you know why things you know, didn't turn out different for the both of us is because you do this for money and I do this because I love it. Very similar to, you know, the dialogue that Cena used, you know, when he was facing Brock. That's what kind of stands out about this. And, and it kind of got me thinking, you know, the, you know, LeBron said something very seri similar on this new podcast that he's doing with J.J. Reddick. And he was talking, you know, they were talking about guys that d don't have the longevity, like they'll get that max contract and all of a sudden they're not in the all-star game, you know, and, and LeBron was just saying like, you know, how many of you guys that play the game actually love the game and, and not just playing, you know, Kyrie is someone that I, you know, you, you think, you know, he loves to play, but does he love everything? And, and and that's that's the thing with 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 LeBron. I think LeBron is very similar to Cena, where you know maybe not the most talented, you know may, maybe not the most skilled. I, I still don't think LeBron is as skilled as Jordan or Kobe. But when it comes down to it, like like very similar. Like Cena just loves everything about WWE. Like he he just he just loves you know doing the promotional stuff and you know doing the behind the scenes stuff and even the entrance here just the over the top marine like entrance it's almost like Cena's gimmick kind of more from being the rapper uh, to the marine and at this time his gimmick is just that he's the the face of the company the guy that's just going to be dependable reliable and he's going to do whatever it takes just to get the company to the next level which you know kind of became uh you know the Miz's gimmick you know to try to take on that role because the Miz was really good at you know, a lot of the stuff Cena was good at as well. He just wasn't as good in the ring as I think, you know, Cena became. Uh, but hey, man, we're going to get down to it, man. We got John Cena, Batista. I got to say, the match was fun. I, I think the crowd was good. I, I think it's probably the best match I think Cena and Batista had. I would actually say it's probably better than their, their SummerSlam match. I think the SummerSlam match is really good, and they kind of played off of the finish with, uh, you know, Cena having to get neck surgery from the... Um, the leg drop into the Batista bomb, which is a really dangerous spot. They did the spot again, but here it just looked a little bit safer. Like Batista kind of did it in the way so John's neck didn't get destroyed. So that was cool. But I got to say, you know, just really, really good stuff here. Very simplistic, very simple in terms of the execution of the moves. Like it wasn't as intricate and it wasn't as technical as Jericho and Edge with the counters and everything. But just everything here just got a great reaction. Just some tremendous feats of strength from Cena as he kind of counters the, 
you know, the, the power slam and transitions it into the FU, which is really, really difficult, you know, to, for him to be able to move Batista with all that muscle mass. And for some reason, like Cena was able to hit the, the attitude adjustment just a lot better at this time. Like he, he seemed like he was trying to get more elevation on it and it just looked good. And especially with Batista, it just looked like a lot of like muscle mass being coming down in the air. It just looked painful. And, you know, e even the uh, Batista, man, just some great, you know, spine busters out of nowhere from the, the five knuckle shuckle into the spine buster just, just came out of nowhere. And the crowd just reacted great. I think the crowd, the crowd was great here. You know, Cena was definitely, you know, the, the only, the last WrestleMania where it felt like Cena got hatred was against 23 against Michaels. That was like really the only time, like, the last time where it felt like legit hatred, but I think ever since then it just this just felt mixed. It felt really mixed. You know, there, there's definitely some scene of hate, but at the same time, there's, you know, there was a lot of love shown towards Batista here, uh, which I don't think he was really getting at the time. So it, it was good. You had a nice little mixed uh, reaction. You got you had some good kicks out kickouts of the fu uh, and the Batista bomb. Uh, Batista did a really really nice looking sweet DDT out of the fu, which which looked really really good. It looked painful and looked it looked good too. So give Batista credit. I, I think Batista looked good here. You know th this was fun. It was nice and short. Uh, the ending comes when uh, Batista counters the Batista bomb into a sunset flip. Then he puts him into the STFU. I I'm not crazy about the tap out though. Batista does like a baby tap. Like, you know, it's one of those tap outs where it, it doesn't tap out with a lot of, uh, you know, authority. Not a lot of, you know, there's no sense of urgency on the tap out. It's almost like he was embarrassed that he had to tap out there. I, I like it better when... I like the Triple H tap out of WrestleMania 20. That's how you put a guy over. But I understand that you still want to you still want to kind of build this trilogy between Cena and Batista for the next two pay-per-views. We're still going to main event both shows. So you had to, you had to do it if you want to protect Batista some way instead of him tapping out like a little girl. So I definitely understand that. But hey, Batista Cena was pretty good. I I got some criticism um for the initial review when I I thought that Jericho I said I thought Jericho and Edge was the better match. I rated that higher. When I look back on it now, I, I would definitely agree. Cena and Batista, it just had a much better crowd. I I, th I think it was just more of an explosive match. So I'll definitely bow down to Cena and Batista. I think this is probably my favorite match that they had uh, when you look back on it. I just think at the time, though, I was just really burned out of seeing Cena win the belt back. It just it just felt like to me, like, I mean, did, did, did we have to do this again? I mean, it's like, what was the point? of taking the belt off of him and you're just going to put it back on him at WrestleMania. I mean, we've seen Cena win, win the belt at WrestleMania. We've seen Cena win the belt back. We've seen enough of it. So that was my reaction at the time. I just really wasn't that, you know, the championships just did not feel credible to me. It, it's almost like, yeah, they, it, in some ways they tried to make it feel like Undertaker and Shawn Michaels is the most important thing on this show the streak is the most important thing on this show. Shawn Michaels' career ending is the most important thing on this show. These titles are just bullshit at the time. But hey, we're just gonna we're gonna put the championships on on these guys just to make the the card look sexy, and and that's what I think the goal was at the time. Okay, next up we have the Undertaker taking on Shawn Michaels. We have streak versus career. Uh, Shawn has to put his uh, career on the line if Undertaker is going to accept this match. Uh, Shawn did whatever he could to um, you know retaliate to Undertaker to you know manipulate him to want to get his revenge. He calls him the championship at the Elimination Chamber. Uh, but yeah, I, I think Sean was great uh, in this whole storyline right here. So this had more of a story behind it. He did a good job of just explaining to everybody that it ate him alive, uh, that uh, that he didn't break the streak. He did. He made one mistake and it was just eating away at him. And he just showed a, a, a nice a nice amount of relentlessness, um, you know, to, to, to get redemption and to have one more crack at it. So, um, it, it's, it's a good storyline. I, I think a lot of, um, you know, athletes and, um, you know, whatever the case may be, so, sometimes there's that one game where you, you wish you could go back into time and just do one extra thing just to, just for you to win the game or to win the championship. So it, Michael's really kind of captured, you know, that athlete feeling, I think, with the actual, uh, you know, feud right here. So um, in, in some ways, I think that's the biggest argument for this 
26 match between Taker and Sean. It's so difficult to follow what went on in the ring in 25, but I think I think it was actually Big Rat that that mentioned, you know, the the great thing about 26, it was in, it was it was more than just the match. It was just the story of, uh, you know, redemption and, and just the, the sympathy at the end and, and, and Sean slapping Taker. It definitely just had a feeling of, uh, you know, both guys had to bring their best if, if, if they wanted to win this match. So, uh, But overall, I, I think it's good. Uh, can you argue this is the best main event in WrestleMania history? Yes, some people have crowned it the best main event. If you go to Wikipedia, um, uh, a lot of YouTubers, a lot of the the uh, e- extreme, extremely uh, over the top YouTube, uh, you know, channels. I think Cultaholic uh, crowned this as the greatest WrestleMania main event of all time. Uh, yeah, I think it's up there. It's not my personal favorite. You know, I- I'm actually going to say WrestleMania 25. Uh, between Taker and Sean, it, it's clearly the better match. Uh, I think my brother even agrees. Like whenever he brings up Taker and Sean, he always brings up twenty five. It, I don't think he even saw WrestleMania twenty six as a whole. He might have seen this match on a compilation or whatever. But yeah, he's more pro twenty five. I think a lot of people are more pro twenty five. But uh, you know, there, there's a few that like the twenty six one better. Um, I mean, would it be the best WrestleMania main event of all time? I, I mean, I, I wouldn't have it as number one. I might have it in the top five. To me, I would go with, you know, Brett and Sean as number one. Just from a personal standpoint, I'm not going to defend it because I know, you know, some people, a lot of people disagree with that. But, you know, Brett and Sean is my number one. Uh, number two would probably be Rock and Austin at 17. And then number three would be the WrestleMania 20 triple threat. But, yeah, I, th- I think, you know, the door is definitely open for this one to be, you know, the, the fourth or fifth, uh, you know, WrestleMania main event ever. Best WrestleMania main event ever. Um, you know, even though I would, you know, rank, you know, rate Angle and Lesnar lower than this, I still probably prefer Angle and Lesnar in terms of replay value. But, yeah, it's, it's still a wonderful uh, moment for Sean. You know, Sean talked about how after the um, WrestleMania 25 match, he just felt peace. He just felt like, man, that was that was the way to end it right there. So why not just end it like that uh, at the next WrestleMania? And that, that's exactly what happened. But um, yeah, man, I, I think I think the, the the match was great. You know, they were able to follow. There's still like there's still something very hard about going last, and you could definitely feel it at moments with this match. But it was still. It was still amazing, and they they still pretty much captured you know the feeling that they had at twenty five, and and there there was some there was some good stuff here. They played off the twenty five match, especially with the dive, you know that that dive that where Taker almost killed the cameraman and killed himself. Very difficult to watch. Very difficult looking back on it. Uh, so yeah, they thank God Taker didn't attempt it here. And, and instead of doing the dive, Sean takes his knee out before he's able to do it. So Sean does a really good job of focusing on the knee. And yeah, that moonsault is awesome, man. You almost forget, you know. So so, so Taker tries to last ride uh, Sean through the announce table. Sean counters it with the super kick, and then he goes for the moonsault on the knee and the table breaks which is pretty cool so so a couple things to think about here i'm 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 saying to myself why the hell did he do a moonsault there um you know maybe it would make more sense just to do the elbow drop i think the moonsault makes sense because you know that's how that was sean's mistake at wrestlemania 25 um you know he knows he's going to be out of the ring this time so it's pretty safe bet to do it so maybe that was the thought process there that he wanted to beat him with the move that he tried to finish him with the previous year and then at the same time there's probably a little bit more impact on the knee if you do the moonsault so i th- i think that was a really really cool spot right there but uh but yeah overall man there was there was some really good stuff here uh, i thought they they just countered you know, off the previous match, you know, really, really, really well. Um, you know, Sean goes for the elbow drop. You know, Taker's got a counter for it. You know, Taker goes for the, you know, the Hell's Gate, the triangle choke. You know, Sean uh, actually does a beautiful jackknife pin that gets a nice little near fall right there. So, yeah, overall, I think everything still looked good. You know, the fans still bought into the, the choke slam finish, the last ride finish. You know, just the way Sean set up the super kicks. And these last two matches with Taker were better than ever. He just he knew how to space himself properly and how to time it out just to get the best reaction out of the fans. And and that's exactly what he did there. There was actually three tombstones here. So it takes three tombstones 
for Taker to beat Sean. The first one was actually on the outside, and then when when he rolled them in, Sean kicked out of it. Sean kicked out of uh, you know the Tombstone here, which you know it didn't didn't generate the same type of buzz that the last the previous one did, but it was still you know pretty cool. And then all of a sudden, Taker started showing you know sympathy. And, uh, you know, he, at first he was a little bit angry. He was a little bit angry. Like the, the, the previous year, he, he looked like he was, he, lo he had like a what the hell? Like, what the hell is this kind of expression? Like that, you know, that, that crazy facial expression that Taker gave. This one was a little bit more like angry. Like he was like, like what the fuck is it going to take to beat this guy? And then all of a sudden he started showing sympathy. And then as, as soon as Sean sees the sympathy, he starts smacking him. And then he gives him a, a vertical tombstone, and, and that's the finish right there. So, yeah, it's an awesome match. I, I do remember, like, the, the next night um, when I woke up, I, I, I remember just dreaming about how good the match was. So when I, I always say, like, the, 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 the perfect indicator of a good movie, and I'll even use this, like, as a, like a dating reference, too. Like, if, if you wake up the next morning like, thinking about uh, the girl or thinking about who you just went on a date with, I think that's a very good indicator that there's something there. There's something special there. Uh, if you wake up and you totally forget about the movie you saw, that's an indicator that it was kind of a forgettable movie or whatever. But, you know, for me to wake up the very next morning and to actually be dreaming about this right before i woke up i was you know that's an indicator that it's, it's a great great wrestlemania main event it was a safe main event too especially you know coming off of 25 where you know the main event really brought the show down this was just a nice little way to you know to just you know be safe about it like we know what's gonna you know deliver you know the taker and sean was so good that nothing could follow it so let's just do the right thing and put it last and it was good, man. You know, um, you know, Sean got a hero's welcome or a hero's ovation at the end of the match. Um, you know, this is the the only WrestleMania besides WrestleMania 12 where it ends with Sean in the ring by himself. Uh, thankfully, this time he doesn't tell Undertaker to get the fuck out of the ring. He actually hugs the Undertaker, so that's pretty cool. Uh, but if anybody has it, and it's really worth checking out, there's a Mr. WrestleMania. Um, Blu-ray or, or DVD, and it's got a bonus on it. When, when Sean gets backstage, there's a whole lineup of everybody just hugging Sean. It's really emotional, man. You know, the first one he hugs is Taker, obviously, and then it's Vince. Uh, Vince just starts crying his eyes out. You could just tell. Uh, you know, it's just it's hard to watch looking back on it. It's just I'm so torn about you know vince and um but when you see vince uh you know shedding tears like that it's almost like man yeah i i just don't want to accept the fact that he's totally you know worthless or totally you know evil and then all of a sudden triple h to him and triple h have a great moment too triple h is crying his eyes out as well and it just it just felt like they he didn't want to let go of sean on that hug and then it's i think it's steph and then it's uh it's actually john laurinaitis is there michael hayes is there uh pat patterson i mean the list goes on and on the, the cena stuff is funny too because you don't hear Sean say anything to anybody except Cena. As soon as he sees Cena, he's like, thanks for showing me the time of day, Johnny boys. So that was pretty funny. Then all of a sudden you get to see Randy Orton, Edge, Batista, Christian, uh, everybody, you know, just hug Sean. It's, it's really something to see. Um, uh, so I, do I think the moment is tarnished because Sean came back at it was actually Crown Jewel 2018? I, I, I would say no. I, I mean, in some ways, I'm I'm happy that Sean was able to make a million dollars for that house show uh, match uh, at, at Crown Jewel. I, I think he was actually bald in that match. I think I did see it. Um, not very memorable. Th th that's like one of those matches that I hope gets lost and underrated and forgotten over time. Um, but hey, man, you know, if, if you're in a position to make a million dollars in one match where, you know, if you go back to 96, like Sean worked his ass off just to make 750000 um, you know, it, that, that's part of the journey. You know, that's part of the journey is to, you know, take in those rewards and it would be irresponsible of him to turn it down, um, you know, just for that one match. But um you know, I'm, I'm glad that the money was there for him and, and he took it and, you know, some extra layers of security for the next generation or however you want to look at it. I, I, th I think it's cool that he was able to, you know, get that kind of money. But, um, well, I mean, w w what really take away from it is I made the analogy with Cena and LeBron. I, I think Sean is a little bit more like Jordan and you, you could really compare like Jordan's 93 
when he was really, you know, burned out and, you know, the press was really getting to him and, uh, you know, the, the, the pressures of, of uh, you know, the media really drove him out of the game or very similar to, you know, Sean, you know, what, what, what Sean expressed with uh, when dealing with that championship run. Uh, but in, in some ways, I think there's something uh, special about Sean, uh, very similar to Jordan, where, you know, he, he was able to end it the perfect way. You know, Jordan went to the Wizards and, you know, people have mixed feelings on that, but it was it was still pretty damn good. But there's something about this exodus of Jordan uh, in June of 98 against Utah, that would, you know, was the perfect way to end it. And even here, you know, Sean at 44 years old, uh, it, it just felt like the perfect, you know, way to end it. Um, and it, and it did feel like for a while, like Sean was like, you know, one of the few and, and maybe one of the only ones that, you know, didn't go back on, on this promise that he would never come back. Uh, so that, that, that is kind of tainted, I guess, when you look back on it, because it was such a beautiful ending. Uh, but yeah, there was something perfect about those two endings with, with, with Jordan and Sean. I think, you know, Sean, I think even Nash said, Nash called him uh, Jordan. He said, if anybody could come back and, and do it the way, you, the way it has to be done, it'd be you, Jordan. You know, we're referring to a possible, uh, you know, Sean and AJ Styles uh, dream match that obviously never happened. So I was kind of thinking about that. But yeah, man, I mean, 44 years old for Sean to, you know, put on this type of performance. I mean, unbelievable. I mean, how many 44 year olds from WCW back in the back in the day would have been able to do a moonsault off the top rope onto the announce table flawlessly like Sean did? I mean, not too many. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, is Sean really the best ever for someone approaching the mid 40s? I mean, mid 40s is really pushing it. I think even Kurt Angle said age 45 is when everybody declines uh, in wrestling. Uh, you know, Danielson has really proved that, you know, early 40s, you could still be better than ever. But that will be the challenge is can, can a guy like Danielson, you know, really still thrive at F, F 45? Uh, you're seeing it with Punk now. Like, it's just it's just difficult. And it's even more and more difficult when you take so much time off between matches. And, you know, we're going to see what The Rock can do in his uh, early 50s. But, yeah, man, I think, you know, this, Sean really you know, look good, you know, considering his age. And uh, I just think the timing was perfect. He, he, it just felt like he bowed out gracefully at, at the exact perfect time. So overall, I think it's an awesome main event. I think it's a really, really good, you know, pretty much great WrestleMania. I mean, not the best ever. I'm not going to say it's better than 24 or any of the ruthless aggression uh, WrestleManias. But, well, yeah, man, I thought it was a, I thought it was a good WrestleMania. Um, there'll be one more WrestleMania related video before the big weekend there'll be a wrestlemania 29 it won't be a review but i, I got something special uh, in store for it I, i've done something like this in the past i don't know if it's going to go over that well but uh it, it should be pretty fun uh but it'll be wrestlemania 29 related um and i'll just leave it at that man so that's wrestlemania 26 from phoenix and one one other cool thing about this show i thought it was really i thought the lighting was really cool how they used those phoenix suns colors the the bright yellow and orange lights to light up the arena i thought that was really cool so yeah this wrestlemania is pretty damn good it's got it's it, it's got the money in the bank but it still has really really good depth i think that's one of the underrated things about it and the main event is phenomenal so definitely check it out if you haven't yet and i'm out